grace, mercy, and peace may be multiplied unto you. I am Dr. Elliot, known as an archbishop, uh, as well as an apostle in the Lord's church. And at this time, I welcome you to T.L. Elliot Ministries Bible Study. Uh, and on tonight, uh, we're looking at coming to the conclusion of a teaching on a specific book in the Old Testament. And the book that I'm referring to is the book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah, one of what many would consider a minor prophet. But as always, I believe that everything that we have in the canonized Bible, all of the scriptures that we have are prolific writings. They're, they're not just downplayed just because they're short books, excuse me. Uh, but I think they are just as significant as the longer books or, or as we talk Old Testament wise, they're just as profound uh, as the writings of the major prophets, as we would call like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who have a lot to say. Um, but I believe there's a lot of power of those who are believers in the word of the Lord God and not just as leisure reading. The more that we find ourselves investing our time in studying what the word says and not only what the word says, uh, but what the word meant, getting the spiritual revelation behind the, the physical or the literal then it begins to open up a whole spectrum of us understanding uh, the greater things of the Lord God. Because, you know, just like uh, as the Bible says that the Lord God is a consuming fire, as the Bible says that the Lord God is a spirit. Uh, I remind each and every one under the sound of my voice as you invest whatever time in what the Lord has given me uh, for teaching that we understand that we're a spirit with a body and not a body with a spirit. So when we understand that, then we have to invest our time to say, Okay, in what has been written for the record, what is the history that we have uh, to hold on to? Let me also invest in the spirituality of what's been written because I, I believe and I believe that a lot of believers would confirm what I am saying, no matter how much or how little we know regarding the word of the Lord God is that uh, the scripture that has been written for the record for us to read are not fairy tales. They're not just bedtime stories. They're, they're, they're not a, a, a Nancy Drew or Hardy Boys mystery. They're things that as we read and meditate on it and as we lay our face before the Lord God and, and pray and seek to get greater understanding, the Lord God begins to speak because the word is the Lord God speaking in, in current time. Amen. And the more that we read it, the more that we hear, the more that we understand and it begins to open up the things of the spiritual realm, the invisible that we don't see. It opens up the realm of the invisible, the things that we uh, may not be tracking in this reality. Amen. So in that, uh, as always, you know, for how the Lord God uses me, I pray that in every Bible study, in every teaching, that those who are under the sound of my voice as a representative for the Lord God, that you get the spiritual revelation and illumination that goes along with the passage in order to make us better believers, to make us better at executing the word of the Lord, make us better at, at seeking and repenting and coming into a better understanding and a better way of living our lives in order to be prepared uh, for the imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in saying that, um, I digress in that area and I, I continue to pursue uh, giving a word on tonight as we're looking at this particular writing of the prophet Obadiah. Amen. And as we even look at that, you know, I remind each and everybody that even the writers that the Lord God has chosen to make a record of what is going on in the period of time that the Lord God is doing a significant work with not only the prophets, without not only the apostles of the New Testament, but with the people that he's dealing with, his own inheritance, his chosen ones that go all the way back uh, to Genesis, goes uh, not only to the garden, but when it comes to a people, when we talk about the uh, of the children of Israel who uh, we look and we see even in the book of Deuteronomy I think around the 32nd chapter that the Bible says they were his chosen inheritance when we 
as individuals in this time have subscribed to be adopted, to be uh, uh, equal heirs in the lineage, whether we're biologically from Israel, whether we're biologically Jews, whether whether we're biologically uh, of the descendants of Abraham, we're spiritually because we've been engrafted in. As Paul talks about, the bottom line is these are our forefathers. These are our ancestors from the spiritual context that we really need to look and, and have an invested interest in what they've done right, what they've done wrong, what they've done indifferent, because in that once again, I believe the Lord God leaves the record for us to invest in, to say, hey, what is my, what is my spiritual family done that I need to look at adapting or applying to my life in order for me uh, to be sanctified, to be in the direction of salvation? What has my spiritual family done that the Lord God has frowned upon? And I need to make sure that I don't continue to, as we say, repeat history. And when we say repeat history, we're saying uh, we, we're investing in not repeating history of doing the ungodly things that causes us to suffer the consequences uh, that comes along uh, when the Lord God begins to bring judgment, when the Lord God uh, begins to correct things in order to set things back in order as he originally designed, as he predestined before the foundation of the world. Amen. And so in that, as we look, we, we, we take this time to not only uh, invest in the physical things that Obadiah is saying, but we begin to invest in the spiritual things uh, that he is implying through the words that have been written. Amen. Now, as always, I tell each and every one, I thank the Lord for the opportunity to be a representative of him, but I will never say that I've cornered the market of knowing everything, but for what the Lord has given me, uh, I believe in understanding. I want to share in order to make sure that those who are believers have uh, as much information to invest in foundation to continue to move forward in the things of the Lord God. Amen. So as I say that, once again, we look here at the prophet Obadiah. And I remind each and every one, I call him uh, the Edomite prophet, because even in the beginning of this teaching on this one chapter that has, as we see, 21 verses, there's a lot of meat. There's a lot of invested word in it. But the prophet's name means a uh, worshiper of, as many people say, Yahweh, but it's more accurately enunciated as Yahava. So the prophet is the worshiper meaning he invests his life in the actions of serving or ministering for the Lord. Uh, um, and so in this, what we find, this particular book, if I can kind of give you a mini recap, is a word against a particular people. The people that we're talking about is the Edomites, who were the descendants of Esau. Uh, for those that know uh, the litany of the forefathers that are referenced in the book of Genesis. We have Abraham, we have Isaac, and we have Jacob or Jacob. But as we know for the record, Esau and Jacob were twins. Esau was the firstborn. Jacob uh, gets his name Jacob as a supplanter because we know uh, from the text that he held on to the ankle of his brother when they were being born. OK, so so in that, as we know, the his, history that goes between these two, um, you know, uh, Esau, whose name in Hebrew means Harry, which we can understand from the ancient texts of Genesis and any other records that have been written. He was uh, a man's man. He was one that got out and hunted. He was a man's man, one that got out and fished. He did, he did all those things that were out in nature where we find that Jacob was more of the cool, calm, and collective that stayed home and learned to cook and hung around his, if I may say, the cliche mother's apron. Um, and he wasn't the hairy guy. He was the groomed guy. Uh, uh, but but in that, uh, we come to discover that one of the most significant things between these two brothers was about uh, uh, the blessing, the birthright, as we know in the, the, the writings that are recording in Genesis. And based upon the birthright, i.e., we know that the record is that 
Esau had no real value in it. I don't think Esau really understood the depth of it. He just said, hey, I'm the firstborn. I'm entitled to it, but it really does nothing for me based on the lifestyle that I live. And he was willing to sell it or give it away to his brother for venison stew, for uh, 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 a plate of something to eat. He was able to or, or invested in giving it away. But later on, he began to, I believe, meditate on these things. And it began to bother him that his brother, as he would say, has tricked him or bamboozled him and pulled something from him that was of greater value. And he held an invested anger. He held an invested hate towards his brother over this specific transaction. Now, what's deep about it, as I continue to remind you, is, a, is the fact that the transaction was something that was not water under the bridge, as we would say in our Western world culture. It's something that, that didn't find itself coming to peace, coming to agreement, or, um, you know, uh, changing the emotional thought of Esau towards his brother. It was so in depth in the life of Esau that it began to transcend from generation to generation that we find that an entire people called the Edomites held on to this hatred, this uh, uh, anger that was between two brothers that now it became a national, listen to me, not just personal, but it became a national anger and ungodliness towards a brother. Because now this anger, this hatred, uh, this uh, 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 place of uh, devising and scheming and, and being happy at the downfall goes against an entire people, Israel. The northern tribe as well as the southern tribe, Judah. Uh, and so now as we see that, it continues to manifest. And, and now the prophet Obadiah, who comes from those people, the, the Lord God has entrusted him and made him a prophet because he looked out for the best interests of the other prophets of the spokesmen of the Lord God in the time of Jezebel. Or if we would announce it in the Western culture, Isabel. So... In that, I, I, I give you that history because, once again, I remind you that it's not something that has been thousands of years ago. It becomes something that resonates even in this dispensation, in this period as believers, because where this historical story rests with us, where this historical prophecy rests with us, we find that the Edomites are once again in a place not only with hangry, hatred and anger, excuse me, towards their brother, but now it causes uh, them to emulate the characteristics of Lucifer. It caused them to emulate the characteristic of the opposer, Satan. And what I'm referring to is the pride of arrogance. Uh, that's what we see that hovers in the midst of this entire writing. And what's really deep about the pride of arrogance, as I remind people, not only with the prophet Obadiah's writing, but we find this uh, trending across many of the prophets writing when it comes to the day of the Lord or the judgment of the Lord against the ungodly or those who rebel against the character of the Lord God, because watch this. It is the pride of arrogance that is associated with the character of Lucifer's fall. When iniquity was found in him, we're, we're, we're talking about arrogance and pride that was in the heavenlies that caused the Lord God to separate Lucifer, caused him to be cast out of heaven. No matter how anybody wants to look at it from their theological or philosophical views, it was the pride of arrogance. And I'm emphasizing pride of arrogance because understand for those who may not know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, there's two types of pride. So you got to understand there's bad pride and there's a such thing as good pride. Bad pride, once again, is associated with arrogance, uh, of feeling better than, feeling privileged. Uh, good pride is known as excellence when you in godly humility 
want to do things to the best of your ability in order to be pleasing unto the Lord God, then that's what's called good pride. So right now, the discussion or what we're really looking at, especially when it comes to the book of Obadiah, is what is that bad pride that a people have festered within themselves because of something that happened with their forefather and their brother? Uh, what has happened that has caused such an amount of hatred and arrogance and pride to continue from generation to generation uh, to in turn turn around and cause them to hate a whole people who's even been chosen by the Lord God? What has caused them to have a distance between them? What has caused them to have a break in, in brotherly relationship? And see, we have to kind of invest in understanding that because it does the same thing now. How are you saying that it does it now? Look at how we are still divided even when it comes to being believers in Jesus Christ. I'm not beating up on denominations, but look at our religiosity. Uh, in our religiosity, we all claim to serve the same Lord God, but notice that because we uh, practice it different ways, we have people even in the body of Christ frowning upon others because they do it this way, frowning upon others because they do it that way. You don't you don't worship the way that I do. I don't worship the way that you do. And so in that it causes us even to slander other other churches. It causes us to slander uh, other ways of practice. Now, I'm not implying that we are to endorse ungodly practices that are are of paganism in other cultures and other churches or so forth but what i am saying is there's supposed to be a brotherly connection regarding uh us worshiping the same lord god uh, if you're uh acknowledging that you worship the lord christ jesus and the holy spirit i shouldn't have so much against me be uh, against you because the way i do it i i should be looking and saying hey how can we collaborate as brothers and sisters in christ in order for us to have a strong forefront as the church not a church but the church and so in saying that um, this is where I'm hoping in the spirituality of understanding the book of Obadiah, what the prophet is saying regarding Edom, that we can, can in introspection, look at ourselves. We can reflect on ourselves and say, hey, uh, based on what I'm picking up out of this, let me make sure that I'm not guilty of doing the same thing that these people are doing because it makes me no better. Let, let me not think because... This is thousands of years later, and I'm in a different place because Jesus Christ has come. Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ has risen. Uh, and I have associated myself with grace that uh, that doesn't apply to me. Amen. So in saying that, uh, as we look at this book, once again, as I get ready to address what I would say are the last verses of the chapter, amen. Uh, uh, this evening, I want to look at verses 18 through 21. But even as we assess the chapter, there has really been uh, some interesting uh, perspectives that the prophet has brought to the attention of the Edomites based on their hatred, based on their anger, based on their arrogance against the children of Israel. Uh, he, first of all, in verses one through nine, addresses what is the prediction or prophecy or the forewarning against the Edomites because of their actions against the children of Israel, their own brother. Then we find in verses 10 through 14, the prophet gives them the reason that the Lord has given him the prophecy or the forewarning of, of them because of how they have treated their own brethren. Then we find... Uh, um, from there, in verses 15 up until 18, the results of the judgment on Edom. 
because of how they've treated their brethren. And then from 19 through 21, we find uh, the prophet addresses the possession of Edom by Israel. So in that, let me touch the last verse of the thought regarding the results of judgment, verse 18, and continue to the end of the chapter, amen? So now let us see what the prophet brings to our attention out of these last few verses of the book of Obadiah. In verse 18, and I'm reading from the standard King James Version, the Bible says thus, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph for Yusuf a flame and the house of Esau for stubble and they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau for the Lord hath spoken it. What is the prophet really saying here? Notice that he acknowledges three houses. He acknowledges the house of Jacob or Yaakov, which we understand out of Hebrew means the surplanter. It also in some of the ancient culture mean the trickster because we understand when we go back and even look at the Old Testament in Genesis, uh, before this individual became known as Israel, he really went through some things. He had to go through some transformation from his identity as a Jacob or Jacob to be known as a Israel who the Lord has prevailed with. So in the working of his life, we find this identity is him having some things worked out in the reality. And if you think about it, most of us, as we subscribe to be part of the spiritual family of Israel, who the Lord has prevailed with, all of us got some work that's going on in our life or has gone on in our life. And, and if we look at that, sometimes in our ignorance of our ungodliness or in our ignorance of our rebellion, that's the Jacob in us that the Lord is working out, if I can put it like that. So in that, even as we look and apply it to ourselves based on what he's saying, he says, the house of Jacob or Jacob shall be like fire. Now, let me also remind you this, when it talks about the house, the Hebrew word for house is bayith, which means dwelling, abode, or shelter. So he says, the dwelling place, all right, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the place of, of character building, let me put it like that that uh, uh, the supplanter or those who carry the character of a Jacob being worked out because of their ungodliness being worked out of them in order for godliness to be worked in them and for God uh, to have his time that they may have to wrestle in order to become the Israel they're supposed to be. He says they shall be as a fire. Now, let me remind you this, the word fire in the Hebrew is ish, E-S-H. And ish means a flame, but let me also, if I can carry you a little bit deeper in spiritual context, look at that flame as uh, what's necessary for purification. Amen. Every time that fire is associated or flame is associated with the Lord God, when we look in the Bible, we, we really come to the conclusion that it talks about, um, if I put it in layman's terms, smeltering, the process of purification. So what's happening in this result of judgment that comes upon Edom? Amen. Because notice that I said, you know, based on the subtitles, even in my Bible for this particular book, this particular chapter, verses 15 through 18 is about the results of the judgment that comes against Edom. So based upon Edom being the way it was, there were consequences that comes along. But the Lord God, when it comes to his judgment, there's there's nobody exempt. You just have to uh, figure out which end of the spectrum you're going to be on. Why do I say that? Well, in my previous teaching, uh, uh, part five of this teaching on Obadiah, I brought to, I believe, each and everyone's attention that when we talk about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is going to be in one of two uh, contexts for individuals. Amen. 
if you are in the body of Christ, it will be the coming of Christ for the redeemed. If you're out of the body of Christ, or if you've been rebellious to the body of Christ, then it comes as a day or a period of consequences that are negative upon those who are not in the family of the Lord God. So it either comes as a great day of joy for those in the body of Christ, or it comes as a great day of uh, uh sorrow because it comes as a judgment or a consequence in negative context for those outside the body of Christ or those who rebel against being in relationship with the Lord God. So based on that, once again, the Bible says that uh, uh, the house of Jacob or the dwelling of those being worked shall be like fire. They shall be uh, uh, going through some things. They shall bring some things as a purifying process. Then it says, and the house of Joseph, the house of Yusef, which uh, for those who may not know the, the, the name or the context of the character of Joseph or Yusef means Yahava has added, Yahava has extended, Yahava has, has, has multiplied. All right. So he says, Yahava uh, in the adding context of character shall be as a flame. The house of Joseph or the house of Yusuf shall be like a flame. Now, let me bring something to your attention because many people will say, well, it's saying one and the same thing as it says about the house of Jacob or Jacob. But notice there's something different here. Um, one is called fire, the other is called a flame. And when I cross-reference the word flame that's used here, what's interesting uh, is it's a different Hebrew word. This word that's used for flame is lahaba. And lahaba means the tip of a weapon. One speaks of fire or one speaks of a flame that we can associate with purification. The other speaks of the tip of a weapon. Now, what is a weapon used for other than to, to defend oneself against an adversary or an opponent? It is used to bring bloodshed or uh, in order to wound, impale, or to kill the enemy. I bring that to your attention because I want you to grab this. What is being implied here in verse 18 is there's purification and there's uh, uh, um, impaling or bringing death in a perspective, in a spiritual perspective, what I'm trying to get to you, regarding the houses that are being involved. Because watch this, in the context now that it says of the house of Esau, it says the house of Esau shall become as stubble. What is stubble? Stubble is nothing more than the ash or whatever is left over after something has been destroyed, something has been consumed, something has been eliminated. Uh, so out of the houses, we find that the house of Esau, which is speaking towards the Edomites, speaking towards the spirituality of those who carry uh, that characteristic of them of being arrogant or prideful and being hateful and showing anger towards others, the Bible says that there's going to be nothing left. There's nothing of value that's left because even if you think about ashes or stubble or, or, or the remains of what has been destroyed, there's nothing you can do with it. It can't be, watch this, repurposed. When the Lord God deals with the people that have ungodliness in them, it's based upon the relationship that they have with him that he seeks to not only remove what's ungodly in them, but in the, the, the purification, in the uh, 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 correction of them. When we, when we talk about like a blacksmith, it's not only to purify metals, but it's to also purify it so that it can be repurposed. We find, though, with Edom, with the descendants of Esau, with those who have the characteristics of the Edomites, then there's nothing salvageable. There's nothing that can be repurposed.
And so in this, watch this, the Bible says, and they shall be kindled in them, meaning it's going to impact their uh, uh, negative emotion. Cause when you get kindled, that means it's, it's really speaking towards your anger. It's really speaking towards your hatred being inflamed. And this, watch this, will devour them. They will be devoured by their own hatred. They will be devoured by their own anger. They will be devoured by their own negative emotion. It will be the death of them. Then the Bible says, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. Notice he doesn't say that it eliminates the house of Jacob. He doesn't say that it eliminates the house of Joseph. Out of all three houses, out of all three abodes, out of all three dwelling places, what is the impact is the one who lives based upon the negativity of themselves, the one that live upon doing ungodliness, the ones that live upon, once again, the character of Satan that caused his fall, the pride of arrogance. This is what eliminates them. Amen. And I believe there is a counter verse. There, there's another verse in the Bible that kind of speaks towards this same language. If I can quickly carry you to the book of Zechariah, chapter number 12, verse 6. Uh, we find that the prophet Zechariah kind of speaks the same language that's being articulated here in verse 18. So this is what the Bible says. It says, in that day will I make the governors of Judah like a heart. Notice it says, in that, in that day or in that season, in that uh, uh, time frame, which we can believe this is also associated with, with um, not only the time frame that is impacting the Edomites, but even in future prophecy of what we are now on the cusp of here in this dispensation as believers. The Lord God says, I will make the governors of Judah. And we talk about uh, the governors, we're, we're, we're speaking about those who are in charge. We're speaking about those who have authority. Uh, we're speaking about leadership. The leaders of Judah or Yada, the praised, like a hearth. He will make them like once again, uh, uh, like a blacksmith doing purification among the woods and like a torch of fire in a shafe. And they shall devour all the people round about them on the right hand and on the left. There shall come a destruction. There shall come a devouring. So the Lord God does his judgment through the people that he has utilized to purify. That's what we kind of draw from this. Uh, you know, some people look at the fact that there's going to be natural disasters. Yes, I'm not. I'm not arguing that there will be natural disasters that the Lord causes to come in a period that we will experience as the believer in this dispensation. But even out of this word, the Lord God says, basically the cliche, what comes around goes around or what goes around comes around. No matter how you look at that, he says, whatever negative emotion, prideful and arrogant things that you do against who I've chosen to do a work in, I'm going to cause what you do to to come back upon you. So this is what he basically says here out of the use of the southern tribe of Israel known as Judah or Yada. Um, and so the Bible says in Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. I remind people, even with that being said, Jerusalem is just not a name. It speaks to a characteristic. Jerusalem, Yerusalem, which means uh, a place of peace or teacher of peace or teacher of order. It shall be the example of what it means to be in order or in godly peace based upon the people that the Lord God has purified to utilize in that territory and evict the ungodly from within. Amen. So now let us look at verse 19. Here's the transition of the possession of Edom. When we talk about the last three verses of the chapter, if I may cover those quickly. Amen. In verse 19, the Bible says, and they of the south and 
if I may, what we believe that the context of the scripture is talking about when it talks about they of the south, we're talking about Judah once again, Yada, because they are the southern kingdom. You have Israel as the northern kingdom. You have uh, Judah as the southern. They're all one big hub of family of the Lord God. However, they had two kingdoms at that time, two kings sitting on the throne in order for, for the government of the people. And so in this, verse 19 says, And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. So listen to this. For those who have been the chosen people of the Lord God, those who are in the family of the Lord God, he begins to reestablish the inheritance to them. As we read in some of the previous verses of the chapter, uh, uh, the Lord basically says uh, that they shall have uh, uh, their possession once again, especially in like verse 17. As we say their possession, we talk about promised land or promised territory. The Lord God not only gives them authority, but he gives his people an authority that goes beyond the scope of people. It goes into the context of territory. I, I remind you by saying that, because think about this, when we talked about the kingdom of the Lord God, why do you think that the Lord God dispatches leadership to go out into the world? i.e. it's not only to convert people to being in the kingdom of God, but it's also to convert the territory that represents the kingdom of God, i.e. case in point. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit further for those that may not know. Notice that at the beginning, even of this teaching, I reference myself as both an archbishop and also an apostle in the Lord's church. I know some that may be viewing this particular teaching may not believe in the apostolic and you may not believe in the episcopacy. But, uh, you know, uh, to not even go down that rabbit trail, let me touch for those that do or for the understanding of even uh, the ascension gift of the apostle that's represented in the Bible. Amen. Apostle, for instance, comes from the Greek word apostelos, which which means delegate, ambassador, or those who are sent. But for those who do not know the ancient history that goes beyond it, because some people uh, are limited in understanding about the apostles, you think that it only happened in the time of Jesus. But believe it or not, there's uh, actually historical records that the term apostle existed 200 years before Jesus uh, came into the earth that we know in the Gospels. All right, now, for that, the term apostle or apostelos was a term that was associated with captains that were sent out. They were officers that represented the king. The king sent them out into territories uh, in order to claim the territories and convert the territories over into being extensions of the kingdom that the apostle came from representing, which has a king on the throne. Now, in that, the apostle is sent out to transform the territory to say, hey, this is now territory that is claimed by the kingdom that I came from. And for those who exist within the territory, if they are accepting uh, to uh, the character, the guidelines, the laws and commands of the king that sent me here to transform and claim this territory, I dub them citizens of the same kingdom. Now, now we can understand what is the real context of, of what's going on even with that function. So, so when we understand that, now we can see that, okay, uh, in the spiritual context of things, there's a thing about not only transforming people or changing people to become citizens of a kingdom that is eternal, but it's also about claiming the territory uh, as well, transforming the territory to being a representative of that same kingdom. 
So what do we find here as we as we see this? The Bible says once again in verse 19, and they of the south, those who are of Judah, those who represent the character of the praised or the praisers, uh, shall possess the Mount of Esau. Now, Esau, once again, uh, has become uh, lofty that they feel that they're in charge or in a high place. Remember, pride of arrogance makes you feel like you're on the mountaintop and that no one can touch you. If you remember, even in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible says, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You, you, you declared that you would exalt your kingdom above the congregation of the north. You said that you're going to be in the mountaintops uh, in an untouchable place where you can see everything when it comes to anybody that wants to come against you uh, and you will have great uh, advantage strategy over them. We saw that with Edom in the first few verses of this chapter, but this is what it says that the, the tide is going to turn, uh, where those who are in arrogance have sat loftily, they are going to come to their demise, uh, and they will sit low. Then it says, and they of the plain or those who are of the lands of the Philistines. Now, as we understand this, uh, the, the, the Philistines are technically, for those that may not know, the descendants of Ham. As we know, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But the Philistines are the descendants of Ham, and they occupied uh, the territory of Canaan. If you remember, Canaan was considered to be the promised land, uh, or technically it's enunciated Canaan. Uh, but this is the land where we find even in the Old Testament who were known to be the Nephilim, uh, as we find in Genesis chapter six. But in, in a deeper sense, not only are they the ones who are the occupants of the territory of the fallen ones, they're also known when we call them the Philistines, it means the invaders, uh, the plunderers, the ones who cause grief in the destruction that they bring in order to manipulate authority over those who they have taken possession of. So in this, the Bible says there's going to be a switching of who has become the victor. They shall turn around and become the victim. Those who have been the victim shall turn around and become the victor. They shall possess uh, uh, the fields of Ephraim and see Ephraim in the Hebrew, who was the second son of Joseph or Yusuf, based upon his Egyptian wife, uh, Asanath. We find that uh, possessing this land brings fruitfulness, just like Canaan was considered or Canaan was considered the promised land. Uh, we find that it's still speaking the same language when we talk about the territory or the character of Ephraim. It means doubly fruitful, not just fruitful, but a double portion of fruitfulness. This shall happen for the people of the Lord God, meaning that there's going to be a transition that's happening. People who have been without shall be with, and the people that have been with because of ungodly character shall come to a place of being without. It says, and of the fields of Samaria and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. For those who, who don't understand this, when we talk about Samaria, Samaria means watch mountain. And, and for those who may not know, when you go back and you look at the historical background of the Samaritans, as they were called the watchers of the mountain, it's because the Samaritans were also descendant of the territory of Mount Hermon, the mountain, uh, uh, which means uh, uh, um, uh, forbidden mountain. This is where we believe in, once again, Genesis 6, where the fallen ones came and made a pact. They made a promise that they would go against the will of the Lord God and they would have interaction with the daughters of men and form the Nephilim and fall and form what are called the Geburim, uh, which we would also consider to be demigods and so forth when one gets back into that uh, uh, historical uh, uh, story. So we find that these shall be once again flipped 
and now come into the right or the birthright of the righteous. Because um, then the Bible, once again, here in verse 19, says that Benjamin, uh, which means son of the right hand or son or offspring or a character builder based upon righteous guiding, righteous direction. That's what right hand as a spiritual or metaphorical meaning uh, has for us as the believers to understand what even is being enunciated when we talk about Benjamin. So in that he or they of the right hand shall possess Gilead, which Gilead means rocky region, rough region, challenging region. Amen. But once again, we find that there's also, I believe, supporting verses in other passages that speak the language of verse 19. If I may quickly go to those, if you turn with me to the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament, the prophet Zephaniah in chapter 2, verse 7, speaks the same language as verse 19 of Obadiah. This is what the passage says. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. All right. And when we say remnant, uh, the Hebrew word is sherith, which means the residue, the remainder, those who are the descendants, those who are the survivors, those who are the ones, watch this, that have gone through the process of purification. Uh, even though some things have been burnt off, even though some things have been lost, what's left as a remainder in righteousness they are what are known as the remnant, as the house of Judah or Yada. The Bible says they shall feed thereupon in the house of Eshkelon, shall they lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. Where they have been in the not, they shall be in the have. Where they have lost, they shall gain. Amen. Now, notice that even when it says in the house of Eshkelon, uh, uh, what's interesting is Eshkelon out of Hebrew means the fire of infamy uh, or I shall be weighed. Based upon my purification, there's a, a weighing to see what is of value left over. Uh, uh, are you hearing me? What is some of the spiritual or the metaphorical context that is even being implied by scripture? Let me also give you one other scriptural reference that I believe ties to verse 19 of the book of Obadiah. Turn with me quickly to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14, the Bible says, But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, they shall spoil them of the east together, and they shall lay their hands upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. We find once again language of scripture by a whole nother prophet that's speaking about hands being laid or direction being laid upon Edom because of what has gone against the children of the Lord God. We see that there is something that goes against the Philistines. Notice once again, the tribes or the people that are being referenced in this scripture, amen? So now that brings us to verse 20 of Obadiah chapter one. Let's see what else the Bible gives us as we're drawing closer and closer to the end of this particular book. Verse 20 says, And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites. All right. So the captivity. Listen, listen to, to what is the language that is being said here. When it talks about the captivity, it's talking about exile. Let me remind you, captivity in Hebrew is the Greek word galuth. So it's not necessarily talking about being incarcerated. It's talking in the context of being exiled, meaning you've been evicted, you've been sent away to not be seen or heard from. So the verse really says, 
and the exile of the armies. Remember, host in Hebrew is about armies. Uh, it's about who you have as uh, your wealth of warfare. So the exile of the armies of the children or the sons are the name builders, the character builders of Israel, meaning those who the Lord has prevailed with, those who the Lord has been successful in changing, especially in their character, shall possess or take ownership that of the Canaanites, the descendants of Ham, which Canaanites also mean the zealous, the passionate, but not in passion towards godliness, just the passion if we really want to put it in layman's context, their passion of the flesh. Even unto Zarephath. Now, what's, what's deep here? Notice that I stated here in previous context of the previous verses about how the Bible uses a lot of language that is familiar to uh, a refinery. What the language is regarding being purified as we say a metallurgist or blacksmith those who use fire those who use transformation concepts in order to purify and repurpose notice that even the term zarephath that comes out of the hebrew means refinery all right so as the children of israel possess that of the Canaanites or the descendants, it's going to be based on the refinery process, the blacksmith process, the purification process. Then it says, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in uh, Sepharad. Sepharad means separated or exiled. Notice that I said here at the beginning of verse 20, it says captivity, which means exile. So it says the captivity, or should I say the exile of Jerusalem, which is in a place of exile, which the exile, watch this, Sephirod also translates out to be known as, if we wanted to label it as a territory, Spain. What is significant about Spain? What I discovered is Spain was known uh, for its culture, its science, and its arts. So those who were exiled as the children of Israel who had been delivered, those who had been transformed, but yet they were exiled from their homeland, they're in a foreign land that this land uh, has become the influencer based upon culture based upon science and based upon art. Now, we look at this, if I can carry you a little bit deeper about that, that's something that still happened today. For those who may not be familiar with Hellenism, Hellenism is something that impacts all cultures because what it is is that when we go back and we look at ancient Sumeria, when we look at ancient Babylonia, when we look at the culture of the ancient Arcadians or Arcadians, however you want to enunciate that, they all had a culture that was associated with the pantheons of gods or, or with other Elohim that they worship. What happened? Well, we find that when uh, the uprise of the Egyptian or uh, Kemet culture came into existence, the thing was they borrowed some of the culture, the science, and the arts from the Babylonians and the Mesopotamians and the Arcadians in order to say, this is what we're going to develop. We're going to take those things that we like and we're going to add some things to it in order to develop our own culture, get our own branding. That's called Hellenism. Well, it didn't stop there. It, it turns around and it happens uh, with the uh, uh, Romans and the Greeks. They said, hey, 
We like the culture that is associated with the Egyptians. We like what they uh, were able to do with it. And so let's borrow some of that and integrate it into us. We're not going to establish our own culture, but we're going to take a little bit from here and a little bit from there uh, based on your sciences, based on your art, and based on your culture. And we're going to label it as ours. And so once again, Hellenism happens. Well, believe it or not, it doesn't stop there. We turn around and did the same thing uh, in the Western world culture. We turn around and said, hey, I like what the Greeks and the Romans have as part of their culture. Let us borrow some of that and integrate it to develop who we are. And so in that, in the reality of the matter, not only have we got the culture of the Greek and Romans in our Western world culture uh, as the United States or as America, we also have a little bit of uh, the Egyptian culture mixed in. We also have a little bit of the Babylonian culture. We also have a little bit of the Arcadian and the Sumerian culture, which is why we adopt the cliche that we're the melting pot. So, so in that, what happens is the more that you adopt everything else, the more you become distant bec from who you really are in your relationship and your identity and your character unto the Lord God. This is uh, the depth of what's really being said here about the exile of the children or those who are the descendants or character builders of Israel. Now, hopefully some can even see the spiritual revelation and illumination as it's to us as believers in this time, in this dispensation, how uh, uh, what the Lord says is everything that you've adopted in your ignorance, even as a believer that has been from other cultures over time, I'm going to flip that because the more that you come into the revelation of your identity in me, the more that you will see what paganism has existed in you. And the thing is, some of it's going to be painful. Some of it's got to be cut out as we understand, as we look at Joseph's characteristic as a flame, some of it's going to have to be burnt out as we look at Jace, Jacob, excuse me, as a fire. These things are going to have to happen because the Lord is redeeming and calling his people back to holiness. He's calling his people back to being into a place of in great alignment with him. So this is deeper than uh, what's going on with with Jacob versus Esau, it's once again something that still speaks to us as believers. Amen. And so in this, he says, which is in uh, Sephirod shall possess the city of the south. Uh, as we say the city of the south, once again, just like as I said in verse 19, since we're talking in the context of, of Jerusalem, uh, we're talking the people of Israel and we're talking the people of uh, Judah or Yada. Those are the south. Now, I will say, I believe there is also two other verses in the Bible or two other passages that su support verse 20. Amen. If we were to quickly turn to first Kings and I'm trying to bring this to closure, but I want to make sure I give you everything that I have gotten that the Lord has shown me to tie to this in order for you to even be able to do additional study beyond what I've given you in this particular Bible study. Here's something else that we can add to verse 20 of, of uh, Obadiah chapter one. Amen. If you were to turn to first Kings chapter 17, verse nine, the Bible says, arise, get thee to Zarephath, get to the refinery, which belongeth to Zidon, which really is a variation of what we're saying, Zion, which is the mountain of God, the, the, the place of uh, purification of God. He says, and dwell there. I need you to exist there. I need you to make that your abode and your shelter. Then he says, behold, discern with your spiritual eyes. I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, the passage is really talking about uh, Elijah and the woman of Zarephath who 
uh, feeds him, sustains him as the prophet or the mouthpiece or the one who prepares people for the next course of events that are divine in the Lord God. But we can kind of even use that as we meditate on it from the context of Elijah and the woman of Zarephath to even see for us being considered to be mouthpieces for the Lord God in this dispensation, how that brings value to encourage us, to empower us based upon what verse 20 of Obadiah chapter 1 has to declare. Amen. Let me give you one other uh, passage. If you were to turn to the book of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse 44. Amen. Something else speaks in the same language. It says, men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witness in the land of Benjamin and in the place about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and in the cities of the mountains and in the cities of the valleys and in the cities of the south for I will cause their captivity or exile to return saith the Lord all right so the Bible says they'll buy buy fields they will take possession watch this, of land. In conjunction with being in authority, there's territory of authority that validates those who the Lord God is restoring to be those as lords in the earth. Think about this. Even the book of Revelation says, uh, Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. What, what makes lords, according to Old Testament uh, context is the fact of having territory that emulates the authority that they have. And in that, let me also add this too, because even as a Lord, it not only speaks towards authority over individuals or people, and not only authority over land, but also the ability of one to have the authority in teaching others or demonstrating to others uh, what that is. Because see, even in the New Testament, when we talk about a Lord, we say uh, we also can yoke that to the term master. And what makes one a master is not just their authority, but it identifies them as one who's able able to teach others in the characteristic of being a master or in the characteristic of being a Lord or in the characteristic of having authority. So we find that to be self-evident, even as what Jeremiah is prophesying here in the text. Amen. So it brings me to the very last verse of this whole book, the very last verse, if I may quickly touch this. The Bible says, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. All right. So it says saviors, i.e. the word savior that's used here is Yasha. All right. Which we also find that Yasha is root to Yahshua, which means a savior, which is the Hebrew name for what we know as the character of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. But in that, I believe his character becomes self-evident in the delivered, in those who have been purified to live in the characteristic like him. So I believe that speaks a little bit more to the plurality of verse 21. It says, saviors or rescuers or deliverers shall come up on the mountain of Zion because that's the same thing what the Lord God used his prophets to be. They were used to be deliverers. They were used to be yashas. Uh, if that's not so, when we go back and we even look at Moses, Moses wasn't Jesus Christ, but he was a forerunner that represented the character of Jesus Christ of bringing the people of the Lord God, the chosen ones out of bondage, out of where they were incarcerated, both physically and spiritually. We find that to be the case with the prophets over the history of the Old Testament. We find the same thing when it came to the apostles, even as the apostles went out to transform territories, as I articulated here earlier, apostles also 
dub people to become citizens of the same kingdom. Well, dubbing them to become citizens of the king, same kingdom is not just as simple as saying, uh, I make you of, of this kingdom and there's nothing else that has to be done. What has to be done in conjunction with that is they have to be deprogrammed of how they have seen themselves a citizen of the territory before the kingdom comes in to take possession. They have to be deprogrammed of the way they used to do things in order to be reprogrammed according to the way that the new kingdom has now taken territorial authority over that that region and in the same turn that way of thinking so that people can legitimately say they are part of the same kingdom because you can be in a place but not of a place are you hearing me you can be in a place but not of a place meaning you could be transplanted somewhere but what happens is where you came from is not transplanted out of you just like many people that find themselves today, you were born in a specific city and in a specific state. You relocate to another one. Just because you relocate uh, doesn't mean that you uh, stop being who you were, where you originally came from, unless you totally evict that way of thinking, that way of living, amen. And sometimes that may uh, take a long time. Sometimes it could be a short time. If a person is really animate about not only relocating, but uh, washing themselves clean of the way that they live somewhere else, then this is what sanctification uh, is all about. It's about separating from people, places, things, and sometimes words that have been said in order to start anew, to be cleansed and have a whole nother living style. That's why if you think about it, the Bible talks about being born again. Being born again is a spiritual uh, metaphorical saying that not only am I committing myself to the Lord God in my life, it means now that I've got to be spiritually raised again, and I've got to not look back on the physical life that I've been living based on not being in the body of Christ. Now I focus everything that I do going forward on the spirituality of relationship with the Lord God and let that spiritual relationship drive what I physically demonstrate. So as I say that, it says, uh, here in verse 21, and the saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge, to correct, to realign, to give guidance to the Mount of Esau. What the Mount of Esau was in, in the pride of arrogance, it's now about transforming that territory or that way of thinking or that loftiness to be a mind or character of humility unto the Lord God. Then the verse says, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The, the, the realm of authority shall now come into one accord under the Lord God. There will no longer be a rebellious place in the midst of it all because all of it now has become realigned under the Lord God. If I may quickly give you two other passages to support verse 21. Let me carry you quickly to the book of James chapter 5 verse 20 the bible says let him know or let him understand that he which cov uh converteth the sinner listen to what i'm saying he that converts realigns him brings godly judgment not in the sense of uh trying to condemn but to realign uh, the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul Notice that verse 21 started with the word saviors shall be a rescuer or a deliverer. James says the same language shall save or deliver a soul from the death and shall hide a multitude of sin. Meaning as it says to hide, it means to not only veil or cover up, but watch this. It also means to hinder meaning uh, based on the deliverance that we are to give in the character 
of Christ Jesus as a deliverer or a rescuer or a Yasha based on this dispensation, it is not only to cover but to hinder what is the unrighteous cause them to to have blockades that occur to say the way that you used to do things now you're going to hit against something that blocks you being able to carry that out anymore let me give you one more one more passage amen and i'll put this to rest turn with me to the book of revelation chapter 11 verse 15 in revelation 11 15 the bible says and the seventh angel or the seventh messenger, divine messenger, sounded, and there were great voices or frequencies in, excuse me, heaven, saying, the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, meaning there was a process that occurred, there was a transformation. What was in a place of ungodly authority, let me touch something very quickly uh, to bring this to closure. What I want you to really understand. Uh, if I may, let me touch something about princes. When we understand that Jesus is the prince, amen, um, according to scripture, he is in association with sovereign authority, power uh, that speaks from the throne of the Lord God. But when we talk about Satan being a prince, prince of the power of the airs, as we, we look in um, the book of John, he's, he's the prince of this world. It's not the same word. The, 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 the Greek word that's used there for him as a prince is archon, which means mind manipulator. So what we've associated is him as being authoritarian as a prince. We've given him power based on our lack of understanding. He's actually a mind manipulator as an archon that we have given him authority because we claim that he has manipulated us. But what the Bible, I believe, brings us into a great context is that that mind manipulation will be unveiled and no longer will we identify him as having any sovereignty over us in this world because all the sovereignty belongs to Christ Jesus as not only the Son of God, but it uh, uh, rests on him as us representing his character, which calls us to be into a place of being kings and being lords as Revelation chapter 19 articulates. So now as I state that, once again, let me go back a little bit into verse 15 of Revelation chapter 11 as it ties to uh, Obadiah chapter 1 verse 21. It says, And the seventh angel or messenger sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The characteristic that we have adopted because we're part of the same kingdom out of the Lord God. We're, we're part of the same people. Now that we've adopted that, we have lordship over the kingdoms of this world or what has been the authority or the mind manipulators of us in this reality. So in that, and it says, and he shall reign forever and ever. The Lord God reigns through Christ Jesus and the character of him forever and ever. This is what I believe that we can grab as a spiritual revelation based on what has literally been written by the prophet Obadiah in this text. So in that, as I've given this from these last few verses of Obadiah chapter 1, verse 18 through 21, I pray that the information that I have released unto you on today has been very revelatory to you in every aspect that you can get into the depth of the scripture and be able to say, Lord God, I see how this applies to us. Even this, though this is a historical record of something that has happened thousands of years ago, Lord God, it is still relevant in the now because I can see the application of what's being said in this passage to my life going forward based on your return, based on the day of the Lord that is to come, based on 
either the happiness of seeing Christ Jesus and being with him eternally because I have eternalized him and made his character my lifestyle or because I found that myself has been in the pride of arrogance and I have been living in opposition to his character that now the judgment or consequences negatively impact me because I haven't lined up with what your word has declared. So I pray this has blessed you in every possible way that it can. I thank you for your time. I thank you uh, for your attendance and I pray that this blesses you to get you into the place that you need to know, especially with the study of the book of Obadiah. So with that being said, amen, 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 and may continual blessings be unto you.